Since the breakout of war in Europe, things have escalated significantly. Declaration of the annexation of four regions in eastern and southern Ukraine signals the onset of a new and highly dangerous phase, one that American officials and analysts fear could escalate to the use of nuclear weapons for the first time in 77 years. Today we're going to explore the worst case scenario. How would the United States respond to a Russian nuclear escalation in Europe? The hard truth is that since 1949, there has only been one response the United States has planned for. It's Major Attack Option 1. But how exactly would an American thermonuclear attack on the Russian Federation play out? What exactly is America's Russian nuclear war plan? How many nuclear weapons would be launched on direct order from the president? How many Russian casualties could we expect after American bombs reach their destinations? How would Russia respond? What risk would America's civilian population face? What would the European continent look like going forward? And most importantly, could the United States defeat Russia in a global thermal nuclear exchange? When people imagine a nuclear war, the first thing that comes to mind is large cities like Los Angeles and Moscow being incinerated in a blaze of nuclear hellfire. While this would definitely be a likely outcome, the reality is that around 70% of the 1800 nuclear warheads currently deployed by the United States aren't aimed at large cities, but instead at an enemy country's nuclear forces. To better understand this, we first need to take a look at America's current strategic nuclear war plan, also known as the Single Integrated Operational Plan, or PSYOP. First drawn up in 1950, the PSYOP focused primarily on the Soviet Union. While today most of the weapons in the war plan still target Russia, other countries such as China, North Korea, India, and Pakistan are included as well. In this video, we'll take a look at a nuclear exchange with the only nuclear power comparable to the United States, the Russian Federation. This portion of America's nuclear war plan is called Major Attack Option 1. Major Attack Option 1 is the most demanding attack option available to the President. Should the Commander-in-Chief order Major Attack Option 1, the resulting attack would consist of over 1,000 warheads. Major Attack Option 1 is divided into two attack options. The Counterforce Attack Plan targets Russia's nuclear forces, while the Counter Value Attack Plan targets Russian civilian population centers and economic infrastructure, assets that Russia inherently values. First, let's take a look at America's counterforce attack option, as it's the most demanding and most likely attack option to be selected by the President. The counterforce portion of Major Attack Option 1 targets Russia's nuclear forces, including ICBM silos, road mobile ICBMs, submarine bases, primary airfields, nuclear storage facilities, design and production complexes, and critical military command and control facilities. The first and most important target in Major Attack Option 1 is Russia's silo-based ICBMs. Russia has 126 operational ICBM silos distributed throughout four missile fields, the 28th Guards Missile Division at Kazilks with 20 ICBM silos, the 60th Guards Missile Division at Tateshevo housing 60 ICBM silos, the 13th Missile Division at Domvorotsky with 24 ICBM silos, and the 62nd Missile Division at Uzur with 22 silos. Russia's land-based ICBM force consists of four missiles, 46 SS-18 Satans armed with one or two 800 kiloton MIRV warheads per missile, two SS-19 Mod 4s armed with one 550 kiloton hypersonic glide vehicle warhead per missile, 60 SS-27 Mod 1s armed with one 800 kiloton warhead per missile, and 18 SS-27 Mod 2s armed with up to four 550 kiloton MIRV warheads per missile. When launched, these missiles travel at speeds of over 16,000 miles per hour, have ranges of up to 10,000 miles, and typically reach their target or targets in around 30 minutes.
Altogether, these 126 missiles carry 211 warheads, representing 15% of the strategic nuclear weapons currently deployed by Russia. When added up, Russia's land-based ICBM force can deliver a total explosive yield of 150,000 kilotons, or 19,000 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. As with all things, there are advantages and disadvantages when attacking Russia's silo-based ICBMs. The primary advantage is that their locations are commonly known, and therefore they can be easily targeted. The primary disadvantage of attacking Russian ICBM silos is their fast launch time. Like the US ICBM force, they can be quickly launched. As a result, they need to be the first target hit in a first strike. Secondly, Russia's ICBM silos are a high threat due to their long-range targeting ability and high weapon payload. It's believed that Russia's silo-based ICBMs are exclusively reserved for targets in the U.S. Furthermore, destroying Russia's entire ICBM force in a preemptive strike can be problematic. When attacking Russia's silo-based ICBMs with nuclear weapons, one of the most critical metrics a U.S. war planner must determine is silo survivability. Silo survivability is calculated with a probability of kill, or kill probability. A Russian silo's kill probability depends on three factors. The hardness of the silo, the size or yield of the warhead delivered to the target, and the total number of warheads used to attack each silo. A silo's hardness determines its ability to withstand the effects of a thermal nuclear explosion, and thus protect the underground missile. Taking a silo's hardness and other factors such as launch malfunctions and warhead detonation failures into account. U.S. war planners would assign two high-yield warheads per silo to achieve an average kill probability of 99.5%. The United States would want to hit these silos hard and fast, so they would use C-based ballistic missile submarines to get the job done. Ballistic missile submarines are optimal due to the higher-yield warheads that they carry, the closer locations at sea, and shorter flight times, which would give Russia virtually zero warning before bombs are already hitting their targets. The attack would use a total of 252 nuclear warheads, delivered from 63 Trident II missiles, with two 475 kiloton W88 warheads targeting each silo. The attack would expend 25% of the US's sea-based ICBM force. Delivery time would be around 15 minutes from launch, and silos would be hit with ground burst detonations. Remember the term ground burst. This will be important later. Up next, we have Russia's nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine bases and naval facilities. The Russian Navy operates 10 nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines of two classes, 5 Delta IV and 5 Barori class submarines. Each submarine can carry up to 16 submarine-launched ballistic missiles, with each missile armed with up to four 100 kiloton warheads. The total number of warheads carried by Russia's nuclear submarine force is around 600 warheads. Today, the principal Russian naval targets for U.S. strategic nuclear weapons are likely to be the ballistic missile submarine basing areas of the Northern Fleet and Pacific Fleet. Seven nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines are deployed at two Northern Fleet bases, and three nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines are deployed at one Pacific Fleet base. Since not all of Russia's nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines are fully operational, with either one or two at various stages of maintenance, war planners must assume that many, most, or possibly all of the submarines docked at naval bases are at some stage of alert, and thus start potential stationary firing platforms. Therefore, targeting nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine bases would be a top priority. War planners must also consider the possibility that Russian nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines might disperse to other naval bases. As a result, other targets would include naval shipyards, ship repair yards, weapon communication centers, fleet headquarters, and refueling facilities. To achieve this, Russia's northern fleet would be targeted with a total of 92 330 kiloton W87 warheads, delivered by Miniman 3 ICBMs. Narapicha Naval Base would be hit with 8 warheads, while Yagelnaya Naval Base would require 10. Russia's Pacific Fleet will be sufficiently destroyed using 45 Minuteman 3 ICBMs. Rabaki Naval Base alone will be hit with 12 330 kiloton warheads. A 
total of 137 Miniman 3 ICBMs reached their naval targets within 30 minutes after launch, with a near 100% predicted kill rate, using ground bursts. Up next, we have Russia's Strategic Bomber Force. The Russian Air Force currently operates a fleet of 50 strategic bombers. Russia's Strategic Bombers are organized into seven bomber regiments and two heavy bomber divisions at four bases. The 52nd Heavy Bomber Regiment at Shakova Air Force Base, the 22nd Heavy Bomber Division at Angles Air Force Base, the 200th Guards Heavy Bomber Aviation Regiment at Bella Air Force Base, and the 326th Heavy Bomber Division at Ukraine Air Force Base. There are over 500 nuclear weapons currently deployed at strategic bomber bases within the Russian Federation. Russia's bomber fleet consists of 39 Tu-95 MS Bear H bombers and 11 Tu-160 Blackjack bombers. The Tu-160 Blackjack can carry up to 12 250 kiloton AS-15 Kent air-launched nuclear cruise missiles. Each missile contains 30 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The Tu-95S Bear H is a long-range heavy bomber with the ability to travel up to 8,000 miles without refueling. The Tu-95MS Bear H contains up to 16 250 kiloton AS-23 subsonic air-launched cruise missiles. The main threat to the United States posed by Russian bombers lies in the AS-15 Kent and AS-23 air-launched nuclear cruise missiles that they carry. As it's generally understood that today the chance of Russian bombers penetrating U.S. airspace to drop gravity bombs is near zero. These air-launched nuclear cruise missiles have a range of over 2,400 miles and can be launched just outside of U.S. airspace. When launched, the AS-23 carries its 250 kiloton nuclear warhead, reaching its target in under two minutes at speeds of over 16 thousand miles per hour. The primary objectives for attacking Russia's strategic bomber force would be to destroy strategic bombers and other aircraft on the ground, crater airfield runways, damage other long-range aviation assets such as fuel storage and aircraft repair and production facilities. An effective attack on Russia's strategic bomber force would focus on the following strategic aviation targets. The main air bases at Shakova, Angles, Bela, and Ukraina, a training base at Rosin Heavy Bomber Flight Test Center, both Kavasan and Kazan Heavy Bomber Production Facilities, forward air bases bases, and additional air bases that can be used for the dispersing of strategic bombers, refueling tankers, or establishing air bases for potential Russian fighter escorts. A total of 73 300 kiloton W-70A warheads delivered by Minuteman 3 ICBMs would be allocated to destroy Russia's strategic bomber force, and as a result, grounded planes would be destroyed, runways would be cratered, making it impossible for heavy bombers to take off, and leaving surviving aircraft trapped. Next, we have Russia's nuclear weapon storage facilities. While Russia has around 2,000 nuclear weapons currently deployed, it has an additional 4,000 nuclear weapons stockpiled at 13 national-level nuclear weapon storage sites. Therefore, destroying Russia's nuclear weapon storage sites would be a top priority. Due to their large size and hardened bunkers that are spaced out to ensure that one warhead can't take out an entire complex, attacking each national-level nuclear weapon storage site will require a strike of 8 W-78 300 kiloton warheads, amounting to a total of 104 Miniman 3 ICBMs. These 104 Miniman 3 ICBM warheads would reach their nuclear weapon storage targets within 30 minutes after launch, with a near 100% predicted kill rate, using 300 kiloton ground bursts.
Up next, we have Russia's nuclear weapon design and production complex. The core of Russia's and formerly Soviet nuclear weapon design and production complex is composed of 10 closed cities and one open city. These cities research, develop, test, and produce nuclear weapons that were provided to Soviet armed forces and that were deployed widely against Western militaries. What transpired at these locations throughout the Cold War was a central security concern for the United States and Western Europe for over 40 years. As these secret cities were discovered through US intelligence in the 1950s, they became some of the highest priority targets for U.S. nuclear forces. No doubt, many or all remain on the target list today. The goal of an attack on Russia's nuclear weapon design and production complex would be to eliminate any future nuclear weapon design and production capability by destroying key facilities that contribute to the research, development, and production of Russia's nuclear weapons. U.S. war planners would target nuclear design laboratories, plutonium and tritium production reactors, chemical separation plants, uranium enrichment plants, and warhead assembly facilities. As a result, the attack would consist of 29 warheads, 9W87 300 kiloton warheads, and 20 W78 300 kiloton warheads. The number of targets per city would depend on the number of production facility targets at each location. A total of 29 Miniman 3 ICBMs would reach their targets within 30 minutes after launch, detonating via airburst at a height of 400 meters. Up next, we have Russia's command, control, and communications. In general, there are three primary targets associated with Russia's command, control, and communications. Space Telecommand and Earth Satellite Stations and Telecommunication Centers. The first and most important targets for destroying Russia's military command and control and communications would be two space telecommand centers and 44 Earth satellite stations. These 46 satellite facilities perform critical functions that allow communications to flow between Russian leadership and deployed nuclear forces in a time of a crisis. Some of these critical functions include ballistic missile early warning detection, electronic intelligence communications, photo reconnaissance, remote sensing, radar calibration, navigation, meteorology, geodensity, and space activity. Since destroying Russia's satellite communication centers would be a high priority, an attack would be carried out by sea-based ballistic missile submarines, using 46 W-88 warheads delivered from 11 Trident II missiles. 15 minutes after launch, 475 kiloton airbursts would incinerate Russia's satellite and space communication centers, severely degrading Moscow's ability to coordinate a retaliatory nuclear strike. The second primary target are Russia's telecommunication centers. These radio frequency broadcast centers serve as the primary communication nodes between Russian military command and its nuclear forces, although 174 targets would be applicable for a strike. Since some of these installations are near high population centers such as Moscow, it's assumed that only 91 targets would be hit with nuclear weapons to limit civilian casualties. 65 targets would be hit with the remaining Minuteman 3 missiles, being struck with 65 300 kiloton ground burst detonations occurring 30 minutes after launch. The remaining 26 targets would be destroyed with 26 475 kiloton ground burst detonations from five Trident II submarine launch ballistic missiles. Up next we have Russia's road mobile ICBMs. Russia's Road Mobile ICBM Force is comprised of 180 intercontinental ballistic missiles, each mounted on a 7-axle chassis mobile launch vehicle. 
Russia's land-based road mobile ICBM force carries three missiles, 27 SS-25s armed with one 800 kiloton warhead per missile, 18 SS-27 Mod 1s also carrying an 800 kiloton warhead per missile, and 135 SS-27 Mod 2s armed with four 500 kiloton MIRV warheads per missile. Each missile is mounted on a 14 by 12 artillery truck designed and developed by MAZ, Minsk Automobile Plant, in what is now the country of Belarus. This mobile launcher is capable of moving through roadless terrain and launching a missile from any point along its route. When launched, these three-stage solid-field ICBMs have an operational range of 6,800 miles, travel at speeds of up to 16,000 miles per hour, and typically reach their targets in around 30 minutes. Accompanying the missile when it's deployed to the countryside are two other vehicles, a 4x4 mobile command post that carries the required support facilities, and a communications relay station that uses tropospheric communication antennas mounted on an extendable mast framework. Russia's road mobile ICBMs are located at seven bases Vyposovo, Takovo, Yashkar Ola, Nizhny Tagil, Novesibirsk, Barnol, and Yerkutsk. In general, there are three types of targets associated with Russia's road mobile ICBMs. Hardened organizational and or communication structures located at each base, 180 vehicle shelters in the 20 garrisons at each road mobile ICBM base, and any of the 60 groups of three ICBM launcher vehicles that may disperse during a nuclear conflict. As with all things, there are advantages and disadvantages when attacking Russia's road mobile ICBMs. The primary advantage is that Russia's road mobile launchers are far easier to destroy than their hardened silo-based counterparts. Disabling a road mobile launcher is simple. The vehicle only needs to be overturned. This is easily achieved with a thermal nuclear explosion. Whether located in hardened shelters on one of their seven bases, or even in the field, several of Russia's road mobile launch vehicles can be threatened and destroyed over an area of approximately 26 square kilometers by a single airburst detonation. Therefore, in the case of a total surprise attack, large numbers of road mobile launch vehicles in an unhardened shelter can be easily destroyed using a small amount of warheads. Secondly, Russia's road mobile ICBMs have a slower response time than their silo-based counterparts. Typically, road mobile ICBMs remain in garrison until tensions merit dispersal to the countryside. Therefore, the survivability of Russia's road mobile ICBMs depends heavily on adequate intelligence and advance warning of a pending attack. Furthermore, the dispersal in a crisis complicates command and control, making the steps to prepare for a launch far more time-consuming. The primary disadvantage of attacking Russia's road mobile ICBMs is that targeting dispersed road mobile ICBMs can be difficult. While the primary defense of Russia's silo-based ICBMs is their hardness, the primary defense of road mobile ICBMs is their ability to leave their bases and disperse, in Russia's case, into the surrounding forest, with sufficient warning time and insufficient satellite visibility for the attacking country to track mobile launchers. The area that road mobile ICBMs could be in would be too large to be bombarded by America's nuclear arsenal thus ensuring that Russia's road mobile ICBMs would survive an attack. Furthermore, not sufficiently destroying Russia's road mobile ICBMs in a first strike would put America's civilian population at high risk. Given that the SS-25 and SS-27 ICBMs carry only one high-yield warhead of probably limited accuracy, a recently declassified CIA document concluded that Russian war planners treat these 45 ICBMs as countervalue weapons aimed at high population centers in the continental US. Taking this vulnerability analysis into account, U.S. war planners would target Russia's road mobile ICBM force using Trident II submarine launch ballistic missiles, armed with 475 kiloton W-88 warheads. Aimpoints would be limited to the road mobile SS-27's operating bases and garrison targets. Two 475 kiloton ground bursts would be assigned to each of the seven operating bases and 20 garrisons. In all, an attack would consist of 54 warheads, with a total yield of 26.7 megatons. Warheads to reach their targets within 15 minutes after launch, with a near 100% predicted kill rate. Due to the fact that both locating and retargeting dispersed SS-27s in real time appears to be problematic, U.S. war planners would avoid targeting dispersed road mobile launchers.
In all, an estimated 746 U.S. warheads would be used in the counterforce portion of Major Attack Option 1, although the U.S. PSYOP counterforce plan avoids military targets near civilian areas. The pure devastation from this attack would be massive. Earlier, I mentioned the importance of the term ground burst detonations. A ground burst detonation is a nuclear explosion in which a weapon is detonated on or slightly above the surface of the Earth. Under these conditions, the total area affected by the blast is less extensive than that for an airburst, but the resulting radioactive fallout is massive. As a result, an estimated 8 million Russians would be dead within 45 minutes after launch. Furthermore, due to the high levels of radioactive fallout, radiation sickness, starvation, and other environmental factors, U.S. war planners estimate that an additional 10 million casualties would occur over the next two weeks. Now let's take a look at the second and most devastating portion of Major Attack Option 1, Counter Value Targeting. In the Counter Value portion of Major Attack Option 1, the primary goal is to kill civilians and damage economic infrastructure. As such, the Counter Value Targeting approach prioritizes large cities and industrial centers, targets that a country inherently values. Counter Value Targeting is considered easy and cheap. Cities and factories are hard to protect, easy to identify, and are stationary, meaning the technical requirements of Counter Value Targeting are few, as are the number of nuclear weapons the United States needs to destroy its Russian targets. Though many experts believe that the United States or Russia would not engage in counter value targeting in a hypothetical nuclear exchange for the following reasons. First, targeting cities just to kill civilians is extremely and plainly illegal. Ending millions of lives with the push of a button is typically frowned upon. Secondly, counterforce targeting would better achieve the goal of winning a nuclear war. While a large portion of Russia's nuclear forces would certainly survive a first strike, over time, concealed nuclear weapon delivery systems like bombers and even submarines would have to reveal themselves. As a result, the U.S. would probably be able to take out a large portion of Russia's nuclear forces to secure a military defeat eventually. Lastly, countervalue targeting on the part of the U.S. or Russia would be suicidal. In other words, if the U.S. decided to target Russian cities, it would be risking the lives of tens or hundreds of millions of its citizens and the destruction of its economy. As of 2010, the U.S. explicitly states in its nuclear policy that it won't engage in countervalue targeting. But if American cities were targeted in a global nuclear exchange, the U.S. would certainly respond in kind. Even though a countervalue attack would be unlikely, how would the U.S. carry out one? What cities and how many Russian civilians would be targeted? Which weapons in America's nuclear arsenal would be used? What would the European continent look like going forward? And most importantly, how many Russian civilian casualties could we expect from a countervalue thermonuclear attack on Russia? 